In the hi-fi world, there's many absolutely beautiful high-end headphones with wood and metal, and they look so pretty, and many of them sound exciting. But are we really looking for exciting sounds and aesthetics when it comes to pro audio, or are we looking purely for audio accuracy? I previously said that small ported speakers that are marketed as pro audio monitors aren't actually as accurate as many people think they are. And then I said, if you've got a crappy sounding room, you're probably gonna be better off with a pair of small sealed speakers like Yamaha NS10s or a pair of headphones. Now, there are objective ways to quantify how accurate a pair of headphones are. We can talk about the frequency response, we can overlay the Harman curve, we can talk about the harmonic distortion, we can talk about the time domain properties with waterfall plots. We can quantify them in various different ways. However, I'm not gonna do that for this video. I'm just gonna talk about from my personal perspective as a professional mastery engineer on what I personally deem subjectively to be the most accurate. So if I say something isn't good, this is from my personal perspective. And if you disagree with that, you're allowed to disagree with that. Even if there's a pair of headphones which are objectively awful, some big engineers might use them. I'm actually gonna mention one in this video despite that. So stay tuned until the end because then you're gonna really hear what I recommend as the best headphones and you're gonna be very surprised in how much they cost compared to a lot of these other headphones I've tried and gonna be discussing in this video. So all of these headphones that I'm mentioning in this video, I have personally tested and listened to and have assessed. I'm not just going off of some sort of charts on the internet or something like that. I have listened to all of these headphones. So if you feel like I haven't discussed a particular pair of headphones in this video, I haven't heard those specific headphones, so I can't comment on them. I'm only commenting on the headphones I have specifically listened to myself in person. There are so many headphones on the market, we need to start off by excluding a whole bunch of categories just so we have a manageable amount to work with. So let's start off by excluding studio isolation headphones that you would use for tracking. For example, the DT100 or the DT150, these are absolutely amazing headphones for tracking. And for example, the Vic Firth headphones are absolutely amazing for drumming. I've listened to all three of those that I just mentioned and they're absolutely superb, but not for studio monitoring, they're not accurate. That's not the intended purpose. So we're just gonna exclude all of this broad category of monitoring, which are maybe amazing headphones, but they're designed for a different purpose than accurate monitoring. The next broad category of headphones we're gonna completely ignore are on-ear headphones. For example, the Sennheiser HD25. Absolutely amazing industry standard DJ headphone. If you're a DJ, you need to get yourself a pair of these before even looking at anything else. However, these are not the type of headphones we're gonna be using for accurate monitoring in the studio. We might use these to check how our mixes sound on a more bassy DJ style headphone, but we're not gonna be using those as our primary choice for accurate monitoring. Next category is gonna be ear speakers. There's not that many commercially available products in this category, but the AKG K1000, for example, discontinued, can't get it anymore. Uh, amazing pair of headphones slash ear speakers, but it's not really what we want. Um, bass roll off, location dependency. We're just gonna skip this category, although it's absolutely very, very interesting, and I'm not knocking it at all. I actually wanna buy a pair of K1000s because it's just so cool. The next category to exclude are going to be in-ear headphones. And again, I'm not excluding these because they're inherently bad. If you commute on public transport and enjoy listening to music, then these are absolutely for you. If you do any live sound work or you're a musician performing on stage, then maybe these are absolutely perfect for you. However, in my personal opinion, despite the fact that there's a bit of a cult following around bespoke, high quality, custom molded in-ear monitors for studio use, I've just listened to it and not been particularly impressed for accurate monitoring. That said, it can be amazing if you need it for the task that it's best suited for. The next entire category of headphones I'm gonna chuck out are gonna be the cheap pro audio headphones that you find for under $300 at Sweetwater and Toneman and places like that. They're all just cheap closed back headphones to a penny made in China, low quality designs. And you might be shocked or surprised to hear that because maybe these are the type of headphones that you've been using and think are good for studio use because they're branded and marketed as studio headphones for pro audio use, etc. So if that came as a shock, just trust me, they're all crap. 
next. So there's some manufacturers of headphones that provide you with a pair of cheap, made in China, crappy, closed back dynamic headphones. And they call them modeling headphones because it comes with some plugin or software which changes the frequency response or adds all pass filters or diffusion effects to try and model different headphones and different sounding rooms. Now, as anyone who knows anything about headphones will know, the sound quality that's going to come out of your headphones is really determined by the construction, the materials used, the quality of the diaphragm, how it's made, the whether it's electrostatic or planar magnetic or uh, dynamic. Or the, the design is really going to be very, very important. You're not going to be able to just slap some EQ on it and voila, it now sounds like a pair of Stax headphones or high-end electrostatics or high-end planar magnetic headphones. You're not going to be able to do that. And everyone who thinks that you're able to do that just by voila, it's some EQ, you're completely deluded. Now, the Slate VSX headphones are no exception in my personal opinion. Opinion. They're just some standard plasticky closed back headphones, which I don't know, you could probably otherwise buy for one, two hundred bucks in the pro audio headphone category on Toman or Sweetwater. And then they've just got some plug in bundled with them, which adds EQ and diffusion effects. No, you can't just make that headphone sound like a high end open back planar magnetic headphone design just by slapping EQ or some sort of weird effects on there. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. You've just been fully marketed to with the pro audio marketing hype. No, you can't You can't do that. You can't make a $50, $100 type headphone sound magically like a $4,000 headphone just by slapping EQ on it. Because if you could, everyone would do that and everyone would just be happy just by doing that. The final category of headphones that we're going to exclude are going to be over ear closed back headphones. Now, I'm not saying that these are inherently bad. These are extremely good for certain use cases. For example, if you have an air conditioning unit on or some road noise in the background, or having closed back headphones are gonna exclude more of that noise and gonna allow you to work slightly better. And also they have some technical advantages because they might increase the sensitivity of the drivers slightly, having more powerful bass. So they have many advantages, but they also have disadvantages like anything in this world there's pros and cons and some of the disadvantages for closed back headphones is if you make a closed back headphone the cup you're creating a tiny little chamber on your ear and anytime you create an enclosed space a chamber now you have problems with resonances with the sound bouncing around in there and creating resonant frequencies and the resonances, because the chamber is so small, are gonna be in the mid frequencies, upper mid frequencies, and higher frequencies. Because the smaller the chamber, the higher the resonant frequencies are gonna be. The bigger the chamber, the lower the resonant frequencies are gonna be. But the bigger the chamber, the more damping material you can stuff in there. So some manufacturers try to create closed back headphones by just making them really big and then stuffing a bunch of damping in there. So Odyssey did this with their LCD2 closed back design. And this design sounds very, very good for a pair of closed back headphones, very good indeed. However, it's still just not as good as a pair of open back headphones. And they're also very heavy on your head because they're so big with a lot of damping material in there and everything's very over-engineered and high quality. They're just very big and heavy and wearing them in the studio for long extended periods of time are going to put pressure on your head and neck and be uncomfortable. So that's why I can't really recommend them that highly for studio use. Most other manufacturers don't take it to such extremes that Odyssey took it to with their LCD closed back headphones. So they'll have less damping material in there. They'll be smaller, they'll be lighter, but there'll be worse resonant problems as a result. So that said, Andrew Shept uses a pair of $80 Sony MDR7506 headphones. They are the Sony MDR7506s. I do not use any correction software with them. I don't use any spatial enhancement software with them. I plug them in and I put them on my head and I have a listen. But again, just because elite engineers can swim against the tired, it doesn't make these headphones good. It just means that Andrew Sheps uses them. Although they're extremely popular low-end studio headphones, the truth is they're objectively fairly terrible. They've got massive harmonic distortion in the bass frequencies and a pretty bad resonance around 4K. The frequency response isn't particularly flat either, and there's quite significant amounts of dynamic compression in the bass frequencies around 4 dB, which makes them objectively quite bad for low-end monitoring. 
So this is where Sennheiser stepped up to the challenge a few years ago and designed a lightweight, high-end, closed-back headphone, the Sennheiser HD 820. And I was extremely excited about this, being a fan of Sennheiser. So I rushed out to listen to a pair when they were released a few years ago with two grand in my pocket ready to buy them. But unfortunately, that is extremely position dependent on your head and it makes referencing basically impossible, just a complete waste of time. So after having excluded a whole bunch of categories of headphones, we're left with the most relevant category for studio accurate monitoring, and that is over ear open back designs. Now you can find dynamic designs, electrostatic designs, planar magnetic designs. Despite the variations in design principles, this is where you're going to find the highest, most accurate headphones. That said, just because it's open back, it's not going to guarantee that it's going to be higher quality for reference grade accurate monitoring because in the hi-fi world a lot of manufacturers focus on other qualities like i said at the start of the video maybe they want it to sound exciting maybe they want it to sound detailed maybe they want it to sound revealing or whatever they want it to sound like warm or colored or expensive or whatever adjective they want to chuck in there and design their headphones to sound like, they can do that, they're allowed to do that, free to do that, and people are allowed to enjoy those headphones and buy those headphones. However, that's not what we particularly want for accurate studio reference grade monitoring. So a lot of these headphones are gonna not sound accurate and they're gonna sound some of these other adjectives. Let's start off with some of the expensive stuff. So the Sennheiser Orpheus is one of the best sounding headphones ever made, but the current model costs 60,000 euros and requires a special amp, which I find very stupid and ugly with its motorized lid, and it would get in the way in the studio setting. And then we have the Stax SR9. They're very good, almost something I'd use for studio use, but the base is highly dependent on the tight seal of the cups. They're around 5,000 euros as well, and you also need a special amp to power them, so you easily spend a few grand more than that, so it's quite expensive, and it all just seems a bit much when there are better sounding options for less money. So the Odyssey LDC4, it's expensive, so it needs to sound expensive. It sounds expensive, it looks expensive, it's very high quality, but it's just not accurate for studio use. The LCD3 is very similar. It's got loads of bass and fairy dust in the high frequencies. So all of that shimmer above 15K and it this results in a sound which has very hollow upper mids and is very unsuitable for studio use. It seems like with Odyssey, the more money you spend, the less accurate it is for studio use. But I know some engineers use the LCD2 open back, but I don't really like it at all for studio use myself. It's just too much bass, empty upper mids, transient sound like there's shards of glass stuck on top of the mix with Pritt stick. I remember the LCD X having a bit more upper mids, which is maybe why it appeals to more audio engineers because it's a bit less scooped. But I remember the upper mid sounding a tiny bit harsh and not that pleasant, but it's still not accurate as some other options that we have out there. Next up, the Sennheiser HD 800. It's considered a reference standard and everyone's favorite word to describe it is revealing. But in all honesty, I just think it's too bright. From Focal, I've listened to the expensive hi-fi orientated Utopia, Stellia, and Clear, and also the much cheaper studio orientated Listen Professional, and all are a complete failure for studio use in my personal opinion. The Austrian Audio Composer sounds very good, but the headphone strap is somehow designed for big heads, and it just doesn't fit my head. So for my personal head shape, the design is failure. And it's not like I've got a particularly small head, so I don't know what's going on there. From Hi-Fi Man, I've heard the HE1000, the HE400, the HE6, and the HE560. And to my ears, the HE560 was the most accurate for studio use. I actually bought these and used them for a couple of days in my studio and then just returned them because I just couldn't get along with them. They just weren't accurate enough. The Bayer Dynamic T1 both lacks upper mids, but also has a resonant high frequency peak, which makes them a bit weird sounding and I wouldn't really use them as a reference at all. But ironically, the Biodynamic DT1990, which is a bit cheaper, actually sounds better. It has those upper mids filled in a bit more and it's got a bit more of a flat frequency response than the T1, ironically, because it is cheaper. And I actually bought these and they do sound better than the T1 in my opinion, but again, I just ended up returning them shortly after because they just have this resonant peak in the upper mids, high frequencies. They're just not suitable in my opinion for studio use. So the Dan Clark Audio Ether, at the time I heard them, they were called Mr. Speakers and they got bought out by Dan Clark Audio but there's just another hi-fi planar without a particularly accurate response. 
The Oppo PM1, they're no longer manufactured and they're also not really accurate enough in my opinion. So I've thrown out entire categories of headphones and I've gone down the list of open backs of all the popular models which everyone raves about on the internet and I've kicked them out for one reason or another. And you might be thinking, is there nothing that this guy is satisfied with? Well, it's actually really hard to make a pair of headphones which are really linear and high quality accurate reference headphones for studio work. Why is this? Well, most of the problem is that designing a perfectly accurate headphone is impossible, full stop. There's no way that you can design a perfectly accurate headphone. It's just the physics involved of having the driver so close to your eardrum and everything involved in the, just the general design of headphones. It is impossible to design an accurate pair of headphones, full stop. It's way easier to make a pair of high quality speakers to, that sound very accurate than it is to create a pair of headphones. That said, despite the fact that there's always going to be pros and cons and compromises involved in designing headphones, there are some headphones which get so close despite their compromises that I'm happy to recommend them. And that is the industry standard legendary Sennheiser HD 600 series of headphones. That's the only thing in my opinion, despite the compromises that gets close enough. You've got the HD 600, the HD 650, and now the more recent HD 660S. And that's got two versions, the first iteration and the second iteration. Now, between the two iterations of the 660S, there's no major difference apart from the fact that I think the first one actually sounds slightly better and you can pick it up now at a discount price because it's been replaced by the newer version. So although all of these headphones technically have sufficient bass extension, they all gently start to roll off. So they all sound a bit bass light in comparison to something like a Odyssey LCD series planar headphone. The ear pads and headbands also seem to wear out a lot, so you need to replace those about once a year. They're also dynamic, so the output impedance of your amplifier can impact how warm the low mid sound. But despite these drawbacks, they're still the most accurate headphones for studio use currently available that I know of. So in summary, just get the original version of the Sennheiser HD 660S. 